hopefully you can see my slides. All right. So good evening, everybody. Uh, good to be here with you again. Um, I think this is, I don't know, Dottie, I think month 11, maybe, or 10. It's been almost, we're in, uh, approaching a year. Yeah, I think um, 11. 11, yeah. So uh, really enjoying these talks. Um, if, if anybody hasn't been on these before and, and seen me talk about old buildings in the Ag Reserve, I'm Kenny Schulz. I live here uh, in Poolsville. Grew up here in town. And then uh, after graduating from high school, went off to, to West Point and to the Army and uh, onward to do some things out in the world before coming back um, and uh, moving back into town in 2016. And since that time, what I've been doing, among other things, is, is trying to get out and explore some of the really amazing old properties throughout the Ag Reserve, because we actually have a whole bunch of them. Um, but then also sharing that those properties with others like yourself, um, because as I, you know, what I'm finding as we do this is that actually a good percentage of, of local residents have a great deal of interest in, in local history. Um, and so it's been fun to kind of watch that excitement. And increasingly, I'm getting more and more emails each week with requests to go check out a different property or ask me if I know something about a different property or whatever. So um, I, I've been really enjoying it, enjoying these discussions and, and the interactions on Facebook and on my websites. Um, and, uh, and so it's been great. I've, I've loved coming here and talking. Tonight, what I wanted to do was talk about some things. I'm, I'm basically going to just step up my soapbox for a little bit and speak at you for a while. Um, but um, I have been increasingly interested over the last year of moving, in, in addition to continuing to explore old properties here in the Ag Reserve, move that into something that's a, a bit more proactive, right? So not just sharing these old places and telling the stories online, which I very much enjoy and will continue, but then also where necessary, where possible, um, if we have situations where there are properties that we can do something about to preserve in some way or stabilize or whatever, so that they are around for our great, great grandchildren. I would like to start playing a more active role in that, which of course is going to um, require help from all of you and, and people in the area. Um, but so I'm excited as we kind of hopefully transition into warmer weather and, and lower levels of, of COVID and we start to return to some semblance of a normal world, I'm hopeful there's greater opportunity to start getting back out there, meeting with people face to face, you know, physically going inside of homes, right? That's kind of been off limits for, for the last year, year and a half. Nobody really wants me exploring through their, their basements and attics when uh, there's a, a COVID threat out there. Um, but then also, you know, bringing people out to show them the properties. I mean, I love doing it here on a screen, but it's, it's that much better when you can walk into a front door and put your hands on the stairwell and whatnot. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that and where possible preserving. And so what I wanted to talk to you about tonight are some things or some specific properties here in the Ag Reserve that I am really looking forward to kind of getting my hands dirty with, hopefully over the next year or two. So I, I don't, I'm not an alarmist and um, I, I think the Ag Reserve is, is in good hands, but something that I have said multiple times in the past is that I think sometimes there's this perception of, you know, the Ag Reserve will one day just maybe disappear. Somebody will just make a decision at a political level or whatever and it'll be gone. I, I suppose that's possible. I don't think that that's what actually would happen if we lose it. I think what would happen, and I could make an argument that slowly it's already started to happen, is we would have kind of these ones and twos, small level situations occur over a series of decades to where we would get to a point 50 years from now and look around and say, what is it that's special about this place? Because I don't remember, I know people have been saying this, but I don't see it anymore, right? And so, a lot of times, especially when it comes to, you know, historic structures and homes that I'm personally interested in, 
when we lose one here or there, many times there's there's good reason. Um, you know, um, sometimes there's not good reason. Um, but but ultimately, I think the general response is like, well, it's just one house, just one barn, whatever. And that's true. But if we go back and look and I show you overhead imagery from 1950, what you will see is about twice as many historic properties that existed then than do now, right? And 70 years is not that long of a time. And so if you go ahead 70 years from now, what does that mean, right? And so I think right now we have this interesting opportunity where we are emerging from, from COVID. I think there's an increased interest level in the Ag Reserve about local history. And frankly, I think that there's an increased level in getting involved to do things necessary to protect some of these places that are a bit, what I would call, in danger. And so what's kind of sparked me thinking about this and starting to strategize how I want to approach this moving forward is a, a couple of things over the last few weeks, really. So the first is I'm a member of Montgomery Countryside Alliance, as Dottie mentioned. And we had a really a small group Zoom session with the county executive a few weeks ago, Mark Early. Talk about a number of issues around ag reserve um, protection and sustainability. Um, but one of the things I had the opportunity to talk to him about very briefly and quickly, but was just my concern that there are a number of properties that are, I would say, on the cusp. Um, properties where if nothing is done, they'll be gone in 10 years, right? And, um, and he was very interested and receptive and, and he asked me to put together a, a list of endangered properties. And so that's been something I've been working on and thinking about. Um, and um, so that was kind of the first thing. The second is I'm now also a board member of Historic Medley District. And um, it's funny, the more you explore old things, the more people come out and ask you questions and ask you to join different groups. And so it's driving my wife nuts as my like schedule becomes ridiculous these days with, with old houses. Um, but anyway, I'm happy to be part of it. I love HMD. And going to my first meeting a few weeks ago, it kind of reminded me of, you know, HMD, when it was initially created, actually was doing a lot of um, proactive restoration work. There's a number of properties right here in Pools. Well, actually, um, Dr. Thomas Pool House, where the Blue Earth was, is a good example, where it was about to be torn down and HMD actually stepped in purchased the home, saved it. And now we have kind of, I, I would argue, a gem of a historic property sitting right there in the center of town that could be gone. Um, we aren't doing that so much more in HMD these days. And, and that's, that's fine. But I think being part of a group of people who are interested and concerned with these properties has been really exciting and, and inspiring for me. Third is this log, oh, jumped ahead too far. Let's see. This log house that, um, frankly, I am tired of thinking and talking about <laughs> because I, despite the fact that I've been, you know, I find all these big old houses throughout the Ag Reserve really interesting. Um, I get more questions on a weekly basis about this log structure uh, than by far by and than any other property in the Ag Reserve. Um, and I, I think part of that is just because of where it's located, right? It's right there in the center of Bellsville. If, if you're scratching your head and you don't know what it is, um, I'm surprised, but it's right there at the, the four-way intersection in Bellsville. And it is curious because I think you sit there at the light and you look at it and you kind of wonder like, what is that thing, right? And that's kind of sparked a lot of questions to me. Uh, and so finally, after uh, getting so many emails, I, I a few weeks ago said, all right, fine. I'm just going to dig into this thing and figure out what's there. And it turns out that um, it's a pretty interesting story. And I'll talk about that a little bit. You might have seen it online or in the monocle, um, but I'll, I'll dig into that a bit in a minute. Um, but it, it, it was a reminder of kind of some of the stories that are underlying these places that are somewhat un, unassuming that we're passing by each day. And also a really good example of a property that I would argue is quite endangered and some a, a place that if nothing is done, probably will not be there 10 years from now. This picture that you're looking at here is I think from the 1980s when it was actually looking in very good shape in this picture. And I'll show you a picture from yesterday in a minute. Um, and you'll see that it's deteriorated quite a lot. And I'll talk about kind of the plan moving forward um, to do something about that. And then finally, the, the kind of this fourth thing in these last few weeks that's really got me thinking about 
preservation efforts. So this is the Christ Episcopal Chapel in, in Barnesville. Um, on the left is from a couple of years ago. Um, and then on the right is a picture of how it looks as of yesterday. So this is, this is the chapel um, kind of right next to the Barnesville post office. Clearly it's, it's being dismantled. And I, I wanna first say, because there was a lot of kind of back and forth nastiness online about this when it first emerged. And I wanna first be very, very clear. I have no interest or intent in pointing fingers at anybody. In many cases, there are actually quite good reasons to take down old properties if they're a safety hazard, if they are you know, infested with termites and you can't, they just can't be saved. Um, and I would say in this case, what, what is nice is that as you can see from the property on the right, kind of looks like a skeleton. And that's because it is being slowly dismantled. So these materials are going to be reused in other historic structures. So that's great, right? Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy about that. The windows that were in there have been donated to St. Peter's Church, right? So that's you know also great. These are historic uh, windows. Um, but no, nevertheless, it's sad to see, right? I mean, it's something, this, this church was built in the uh, 1870s. I think it was actually officially consecrated in 1878. It was built by William T. Hilton. Right. So it's kind of it's interesting. I mean, the Hiltons are obviously very much still there. Right. Which is really cool to see because we do not have a whole lot of cases left in the Ag Reserve where original families are still in ownership positions of historic structures like this. Right. So it's quite unique. Um, so, you know, I would assume in the next few weeks, this will be a completely empty lot as they you know, finish the dismantling. Um, sad story, but also potentially just just another reminder that for all intents and purposes, we lost to this structure probably 10 to 20 years ago, right? This, is, this was a structure that was still standing, but my guess is probably if, some, if in the last five to 10 years, if you'd have come in and tried to do something, it was probably too late. And, and, it, and it's got me thinking, okay, so what are those other places that are right on the cusp of falling into that zone where they're like, they're kind of like dead men walking, right? They're still technically with us. They're still technically standing up, but actually they've passed the point of us being able to do anything about it. Um, so all of these things kind of, I've been thinking about, there's been a lot of discussion online about it, a lot of interest in it, which I think is great. Um, and causing me to think about, you know, this set of what I would consider endangered properties, which is what I wanted to walk you through tonight. So the first is this, this smokehouse, right? So if you read the article, and I, and I don't want to rehash it too much if you read it, um, and if not, it's um, online or in the monocle from the last edition. Um, but essentially what we have here is a situation in the early 1870s where uh, a guy named John Belt and his partner, Francis Griffith, their business partner, they build a home right on the corner of that four-way intersection. Uh, they run a store out of the, the downstairs of the home. Sounded like it was some kind of general store. And then I believe it was Frank Griff or Francis Griffith. Also, that was the post office for Bellsville. So he served as kind of the, the postmaster for, for Bellsville, kind of out of that structure, out of an adjacent structure. It's hard to tell. And you can see here, this is the map from 1879. Um, so relatively new structures at this point. We believe that that log house was built at the same, around the same time that this home was built in the early 1870s, probably around 1873. And that log structure was essentially a, a, a smoke house or a meat house for John Belt's store, right? You could smoke meat and hang it back there and then sell it at your store. Um, I wouldn't say Bellsville was a metropolis at any point in time, but as you can see from the map, actually there were a significant amount of properties and that four-way intersection, there was a whole lot of business and commerce taking place. At the top of the map, you can see the Monocacy Cemetery, which is obviously still very much with us. And there was a chapel there. And so there was, there was a lot of you know, back and forth through these crossroads, especially as people were moving from Poolsville out to Barnesville or even up to Frederick. Um, so you know, it was kind of a, a bustling little, little crossroads here that they were running at. And so this is the home that they built. And 
uh, I, I was really surprised to see this home. I hadn't ever seen it before. And it's funny when you look to the far left of the picture, what you're looking at is the road that if you were to keep going down that road, you'd have the firehouse right there to your right, right? So that the road looks very kind of small and rural and rustic compared to how it looks today. Um, but as you can see, I mean, this house is literally right up on the intersection. And my understanding, talking to some local residents who have been around Bellsville for a long time, is that in the 1970s, the home fell into some pretty bad shape. And in addition, it was a significant safety concern given how tight it was up on that intersection. And I suspect they were also, you know, plans were in works to kind of expand the road there. Uh, and so the decision, sadly, but a good example of probably necessarily, the decision was made to take the home down. So this was an example of a home where the, the fire department came in, did a controlled burn, they practiced on it, right, got some training out of it, and the home came down. But as a result, you know, the home comes down and we're, you know, we're kind of left with that log smokehouse sitting out there prominently as if it was built and there was nothing else around it, right? So that's kind of how it ends up there in the middle of this field. And you can see here's the overhead shot um, of, of downtown Bellsville in, I think, 1972. So you can see the home there in red. And then across the street, you can see that Darby store that was refurbished a few years ago. And, um, and I'd also note, you know, one of the things, if you've been to that store, one of the things they did when they restored it was they actually set it back further off the road. They actually moved the whole structure. And you can see here, if you're looking at the picture, it's actually very tight up on the road. Now it's, it's still close, but it's, it's a bit further back. Um, and then you've got obviously Bassett's here, or excuse me, Bassett's uh, stops here. Um, and then the cemetery would be out here to your far left. And so, so this, this log house is interesting to me um, because as I kind of detailed in the story, there, there's this, as I was kind of digging in and looking for something like, you know, hoping I could find something kind of interesting about this place. Um, I came across a newspaper article from 1877 detailing this incident where an individual by the name of Henson Ames, and he was known as quote, a desperado, which I think is funny that they referred to somebody as a desperado back in those days, but he was accused by um, Lemuel Bell, who was living of Bellsville, who was, I, I believe, living right next to that house that was in front of this, or maybe even living in the house for a time. It was, it's a little, little murky on the details, but Bell accuses this desperado of stealing some kind of meat out of this log structure. And as a result, Henson Ames is angry about this accusation. He confronts Beale. They, you know, have kind of this standoff for a day or two, and then they end up getting into this, sounds like quite a, a fist fight uh, initially, where Henson Ames is attacking uh, Beale with this long stick. And then at the last moment, Beale pulls out a handgun to try to fight him off, and he fires some shots, but misses. And then as the newspaper article says, Beale manages one final punch on this guy, he falls backwards. And when he falls, he breaks his neck and dies. That story sounds a bit odd to me, um, but sure. I mean, that, you know, it's 1877. I'm, I'm not gonna question that. At the end of the day, the result is this Henson Ames individual was dead. And, and based on the reports, it sounds like there was a bunch of people around that were watching this. And I suspect maybe since he was kind of a known desperado, they weren't necessarily all that upset about it. And I suspect that the story is a bit more complex than the one that ended up in the newspaper, but everybody in town probably looked at each other and said, hey, you know what, this is fine. Um, Beal did immediately jump on his horse and ride into Poolswell and, and turn himself in to the authorities. Um, unfortunately, I could not find anything further to let us know like, what happened? You know, did he end up in prison? Did he, what, what, what's the conclusion of that story? Um, so it kind of just ended there on a cliffhanger. So if anybody can figure that one out, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear it. So you can see the structure on the left. It's, it's in the eighties on the right. That's, that's literally from yesterday around this time I drove out there and, and took this picture um, clearly in rough shape. Right. And, and clearly, I mean, you can see um, you can't tell from this angle, but the roof, 
is, is missing in a number of places. Um, the chinking between those logs is largely just gone. I mean, you can almost see right through the structure. Um, so it's going to need a decent amount of work. The positive is I am, as of last night, in touch with the individual who owns this log structure. And he is very interested in doing something to stabilize it and, and get it back into some condition um, where it'll be around for you know, another century or two. So right now, he, he's actually um, a general contractor him, himself. So I've asked him to give it a good look and give me an idea of what that cost might be. And then what we can do is start thinking about you know, various grants here available to us in the county, maybe even some, some public kind of you know, fundraising type thing if people are interested, we'll see. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a couple of avenues to take it. And if nothing else, it's, it's good to hear that the owner is interested in preserving it. And I think there's good momentum right now in the community to maybe do something about it. So more to come, but that's kind of where it stands today. Okay, so the next place is the Warren Historic Site. This one I'm showing you right here. This is, this is like textbook example of what good preservation looks like, right? These are the, these are the same buildings. Um, and this, the, the Warren Historic Site is a site with three primary structures. It's the Warren Historic Church, the historic uh, African-American school building right next to it, and then right behind it, the Loving Charity Hall, which is kind of a, a social gathering place, which is the building that you're looking at here. Um, this, this kind of three-part complex was part of the Martinsburg African-American community that um, was established by largely freed slaves in the Martinsburg area following the Civil War. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I believe it's the only remaining uh, kind of site where all three structures are still intact in, in the state of Maryland um, for, a, for a former African-American community. So it's, it's quite a special and important place to protect. And as you can see here, um, they did some work a few years ago with grants to actually restore this charity hall. I mean, this on the left, right? That's, that's kind of how that chapel looked, you know, a year or two ago. And that, that same ending could have happened here and it didn't. So this is, this is very much a good news story. However, my focus here um, with the Warren Historic Site is the, the original church is actually about a mile away from where the church is now. The church is, the, the original church is gone. It was actually rolled down on timbers from where it was to its current site. Um, so that church that you pass by out, if you're going out towards White's Ferry with the intersection of Martinsburg Road, the white church is right there. That's actually the second one. Um, the first one was built in the late 1800s. That second one, I think, came around in the early 1900s. But out where the original church site was still remains the original cemetery. And this cemetery is, a, is a, an incredibly um, interesting, moving place. I mean, it's deep, deep back in the woods. Um, you can see here, you know, when... African Americans died, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In many cases, there was not money or resources to, you know, get these big fine tombstones that we see at, you know, some of the, you know, family cemeteries around these larger, you know, um, white family structures. And so, as a result, the, the markers are, in many cases, just upturned Seneca sandstone, right, marking, you know, that final resting space not marked, you know, maybe a letter or two chiseled in, but, but largely unmarked, but still obviously a, a very important spot um, to preserve. And I mean, what we have here, this is the very front part of the cemetery, which actually is in quite good shape. If you continue to walk back in, into these woods behind this, what you're looking at, what you'll find is basically these indicators of, of graves all spread throughout the woods. And a number of the individuals that are buried here at this site started their lives enslaved, right? Um, and, and some, I mean, for all I know, maybe some actually died enslaved and were buried here. Um, but my impression is many born before the Civil War died after as they were part of this Martinsburg community and are buried at this site. And so what we are interested in doing moving forward here 
is working with kind of the, the, the leaders of this Warren Historic Site who I've been in touch with and been out to the site with a couple of times, um, but getting you know a crew together to get out here and really clear this site of, of brush um, so that we can actually bring in some experts to, to actually physically mark, mark, map the site uh, and put it on, like, on GPS into the county records. So that one, so it's preserved and there's record of it, which is really important. But two, it, it keeps away developers and any future kind of interference in this spot, which um, I don't know if Glenn Wallace is on, but he will tell you there have been cases in Frederick County where because a cemetery was not marked on site, developers will come in and build a new neighborhood and they will bulldoze right over it. Um, and they, it, that's just what happens. It's not marked, it's not in the records. So there's no registry of it and it just goes away. So obviously we're gonna do everything we can to ensure that doesn't happen. Hanover, this is, um, I, I've talked about this one a lot, so I won't spend too much time, but so Hanover is a historic home built in 1804. It was built by a member of the Hempstone family. So if any of you live in Wesman, you know, Hempstone Avenue, that is named after the Hempstone family. Uh, the Hempstone that built this, uh, as I mentioned, fought in the Revolutionary War. Following the war, came back to this area, had a, had a, a significant parcel of land um, near Bellsville, actually very close to the, uh, the log structure just down the road. Um, this home has been empty for at least a decade, if not longer. It's on the Four Streams golf course. And as far as I can tell, there's really no plan for it. Um, it's on the historic registry. <coughs> and, uh, you know, houses... Houses are not meant to sit empty for long periods of time, right? It's not good for a house to sit empty that long. They deteriorate fast. And so my concern is without some stabilization efforts, um, you know, this one, it's, it's built quite solid. Don't get me wrong, been around since 1804, um, but it can only survive mother nature for so long. So this is, this is another one that's, this is one's gonna be pretty tricky, um, but where I plan to leverage some <laughs> some local support to, to get some pressure to do something here. <clears throat> okay. So the Young Family Cemetery is a spot. I've talked about this one before. I, I really love this spot, but the um, for those of you familiar with East Oaks, the old home out on White's Ferry Road, it's a home built by the Young family in the 1820s. Quite a uh, prosperous family. Um, were involved in a number of innovative farming techniques in the area where they made a lot of wealth and uh, built a number of farms in the area, kind of almost kind of on four corners of where uh, White's Ferry Road intersects with Edwards Ferry Road, if you can picture that. And for the longest, for the last 70 or 80 years, the question has been, where is the family burial plot? We knew that the, it was somewhere, but it was unclear where, <coughs> excuse me. And so a few months ago, or I'm sorry, about a year ago, um, I did an article on this, got a call from somebody who mentioned, hey, you know, I've been out in that area and I, I'm pretty sure I saw a cemetery one time. I don't know. I don't know what it was. I didn't stop to look at it, but you know, might might be something of interest. And so uh, we went out there and convinced the the property owner to let us out there. He didn't even realize it was there. And we came into this clearing, and you can see kind of the pictures here. This is how it looked as we walked up upon it. But immediately, you've got these tombstones just lying all over the place. Now, to be clear, those have not been knocked over by any human. They've been knocked over because when the cemetery was built and then I, I assume maintained throughout the late 1800s, they planted a bunch of large oak trees kind of at the corners of this site to kind of mark it off. And so just over decades, you've got these huge limbs just falling down on these stones repeatedly. And that's what that's what's caused them to, to knock over and in some cases even crack. Um, so we discovered it and then last January, we were able to get in with a group of people and clean it up. So this is kind of how it looked um, when we were done cleaning it up. 
we leave the stones down because um, chances are if we put them up, they'll get knocked over again. And you know, a lot of them are in really good shape, so we don't want that to happen. Um, however, this site, I mean, this was in January, this was right before COVID hit, right? So it's been, you know, we've been through one full summer with all that growth coming back. We're about to go through another. So my strong suspicion will be that come this fall, it's going to require another team of people to go out there and clear this site um, and, um, and trim back some of these trees a little bit. So this is one of those things where it's not going anywhere. We now have it on the county records. It's marked, which is great, um, but it's gonna require some kind of maintenance if we, want, if we want it to stay in some kind of reasonable shape. <coughs> okay, here's the Trundle Farm. This is out on Martinsburg Road. So you might, you might recognize it, it's, it's, it's odd. So it's associated with the Otho Trundle Farm. And it's, it's kind of, I guess, kind of funny. Maybe it wasn't funny at the time, but when Otho, Otho Trundle built his farm in the 1820s, he built this barn, uh, I believe in the 1830s. And sometime shortly after that, the county came in and said, hey, uh, we're putting a road in, which is great, but, um, it's going to go right between your house and your barn. <laughs> so now you've got kind of this funny situation where the barn's on one side, the house is on the other as you drive through. That's kind of what took place. Uh, but Otho Trundle was smart. He's very, this, this site is pretty close to Monocacy Aqueduct. And what we think actually happened was he recognized, hey, I've got all of these really, really good stone masons out here about a mile away at Monocacy Aqueduct. They're finishing up work. Those guys are all looking for jobs. And I need a barn. So why don't I, instead of building kind of a, a, a barn out of wood, let me hire some of these guys for a little bit cheap since they're already here and get them to build this. And so as a result, he gets this incredibly beautiful and very strongly built stone barn from you know the Mason's labor here. So we think that the individuals who built this are the same ones who built the aqueduct. Um, and, you know, it's been described as one of the most, you know, impressive stone barns in the county. Um, there aren't many left, right? So there's, I know there's one out at Inverness in Dickerson. There's another at East Oaks. There might be one or two more that I'm not thinking of, but I can, I can count just as many that I know that we've lost in the last 50 years of stone barns. Um, so they are, they are very much kind of an endangered species here. And my, my concern with this barn is, and I haven't talked to the property owner yet. And for all I know, there's a crew coming tomorrow to completely fix it. And if that's the case, great. Um, but my concern is that it seems like increasingly as I drive by, um, it's falling into disrepair. <laughs> there's some issues with the roof that are clear. And then, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but at the rear back, there's this kind of this header that goes over this almost door opening. <clears throat> and it's been, it's been cracked. And these pictures from 1970s, it's cracked in these pictures. So I'm not a structural engineer. Maybe, maybe that's totally fine. It just seems like at some point that's going to give out. And if it does, I don't know what that's going to mean for the back of that foundation. So this is one where I, I don't know what the story is exactly. I am interested if anybody happens to know who wins it, I am interested in talking to them just to figure out, you know, what, you know, what work they've done to think about that. And if there's any interest in trying to find some solutions just to make sure this thing again is, is with us in another hundred years. And then the, the Sugarloaf Mountain Chapel. So <clears throat> this is a really interesting one. Um, I, I hadn't, I haven't really spent much time looking into this place or even going out to it, but somebody from Montgomery Countryside Alliance actually recommended that I, you know, kind of think about adding it to a list of, of structures that might need some attention. This is another chapel that was built by William T. Hilton. So he built that, the, uh, you know, the Christ Episcopal Chapel um, up in Barnesville. He also built this one. He built this one about 15 to 20 years before he built the one in Barnesville. And this one obviously is of brick relative to the, to the wood in Barnesville. Um, so this came around in 1861, right? So very interesting time to be finishing up a property um, on the East Coast with the Civil War kicking off the same year. Um, 
my understanding here is that the interior of the structure probably needs some some maintenance and work but there's also an associated cemetery here that's largely been i mean i think it's in decent shape i know glenn wallace has been out there to to check on it and um and do a, a full report on it and it seemed like it was in okay shape but that there were a lot of things that needed to be potentially maintained or stabilized with it so this one i don't i don't have a ton of information on what exactly is going to need to be done but i do i do want it to be one of those ones where um it, it gets some attention because it's kind of out there on its own you've, you've probably passed it before maybe you know exactly where this is but it's it's out if you drive past um maybe the Comus Inn is a good reference point. If you drive out past that and keep going, you kind of go downhill and turn. And as you turn, it's right there on your left. So really cool, impressive structure. And again, another one built by the Hilton family. So that's, that's interesting in its own right. Okay, so that's, that's my list right now. Um, I'm curious to hear if anybody has questions or comments or maybe even a property you think that I should look at and add to the list. <laughs> Feel free to send your questions in the chat or <laughs> unmute and ask them. Uh, the first question I have in the chat is Sugarloaf Mountain Chapel. Two front doors is interesting. Any idea of logic? Yeah, I, um, Jack, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I don't know. And the other kind of interesting thing about it is not only two front doors, but then you've got that one door right there on the side, right? Um, so unfortunately, I haven't, I suspect that if we were to get into the interior, perhaps it would make a bit more sense to us as we saw the layout. It, it's possible that it's just the way that the pews were set. Um, and that was kind of how, you know, they would enter. But, and, and even in the windows above, above the, um, the door. So I haven't managed to actually get inside this one yet. I'm, I'm hoping to soon. Again, this kind of gets back to with COVID lifting, it, hopefully it will get easier to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mystery too. I don't, I can't think of any other church that I've ever seen that has two doors quite like that. Steve, do you want to elaborate on your question? In your intro, you said there will be more, I'm not sure if there's a misspelling on the yeah, last page. Yeah, it's, uh, I've never been able to type on this laptop. No problem. <laughs> uh, in the intro, you mentioned something about wanting to bring in more proactivity into the, to your efforts to deal with properties. And I wondered if that uh, implied that you were going to pursue something in the uh, a legal um, uh, liaison or, or alliance, I should say, that would protect properties? Or were you, did you have a society in mind? Were you, you have a yeah. club, something like that? Right, so that's, it's a good question. So yeah, so people have suggested before potentially even kind of starting some kind of um, preservation type nonprofit, which, you know, is interesting to me. Um, I think my wife would probably kill me if I tried that at this moment. Um, but, you know, this is, I think this is a little bit where my linkage to um, Montgomery Countryside Alliance and maybe even HMD can come into play a little bit. So for things like um, grant funding, right? You know, I, as, a, as an individual citizen or person, in most cases, I can't really apply for grants to me to fix something, right? But what I can do is um, working with these organizations, um, have the, the, the funding arms come through them um, to, to help us do some of these things, right? They, there's also kind of some legal components to both organizations that they have that they can bring to the table that, you know, as a part of their board, I can kind of hopefully play with a little bit here. Um, and then also, you know, so there, a lot of these structures are on the Maryland Registry of Historic Properties. 
And like, so this, this Sugarloaf Mountain Chapel is, is one, that it is on the registry. And the, the reality is that um, demolition by neglect is, is very much illegal. Um, that, that is not legal. And I don't, I have no intent of kind of, um, you know, calling properties out. But I think that, and, and my interest is in, you know, like, like the log house, for example, which is not on the registry, by the way. So if that was to fall down, that's not like something that the, the county or the state is necessarily concerned with. But in a situation like that, my interest is really in working with the property owners to figure out, hey, how do we, how do, we do something about this? Like, I don't really care who's responsible or how I got into this shape or whatever. It is what it is, but like, let's figure out what to do about it. But in other situations where there's clearly no interest, there's clear neglect taking place, um, there's zero responsiveness from property owners, I'm not too concerned with ensuring that at least somebody at the county is aware of that. Now, whether or not anything happens, who knows. Um, but I think for a long time, especially here in the Up County, there just hasn't been a whole lot of focus on that for good reason, right? There's a million other things going on. Um, but I, I, you know, there, there, there does need to be a little bit of accountability. Uh, and I know there, there, it's a, it's always kind of a touchy sit. We saw this online, you know, a few people talking about even the chapel, it's always kind of a touchy situation. Anytime somebody is looking at a property that's not theirs and suggesting that the property owner should do something about it. I get that at the same time. Um, when you own a historic property, especially one that's on the registry, you, you like it or not, you do have some responsibility to maintain it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a matter of kind of finding that balance where everybody's kind of happy, nobody feels like they're being called out. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the structure is still there or, or some, some outcome is, is found where everybody's kind of happy. Maybe that even means moving the structure to a different place or whatever, but as long as the kind of structure is still intact. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it right now. Emily uh, had an interesting comment. Oh, pardon me. Go go ahead. No, I was just going to read Elizabeth's question. Is that what? Well, I was going to mention first, yeah, that Emily had mentioned that the two entrance doors are often oh. seen in Quaker meeting houses. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, okay, interesting. That is, uh, so I know that this was built as a, I want to say as a Methodist um, place of worship. Uh, but it, it seems like when you look at the history of some of these chapels, I mean, I mean, they're out in kind of the middle of nowhere now. So you can imagine in 1861, how kind of desolate this area was around. And it seems like in many cases, these structures were actually used by multiple different congregations because these congregations were like 15 to 20 people, right? So, so who knows, maybe that, that were, there was some kind of design there related to, to the Quaker um, religious views there. Um, and then Elizabeth asked about the Civil War house at Great and Small. Yes, this is probably one of, if not the, my favorite historic old home in the Ag Reserve. Um, it's the Joseph White House uh, built in the 1820s. Um, the house is abandoned. It's not been lived in for, for quite some time. Um, if you go to my website, I'm gonna type it into the chat too, so you can check it out. Um, you will see that property, uh, sorry, I can't type and talk at the same time. You will see um, that property listed under the, the property exploration section. Um, so, so Joseph White built that home. He had a number of kids. I, at least two of them actually went and fought for the Confederacy, uh, both of which were, they were captured and taken prisoner of war for a while and then paroled at, uh, at White's Ferry. Um, before returning home at the conclusion of the war. That house, it is, um, it is abandoned and it's quite clear it's abandoned when you look at it from the outside. The, the positive with that one is it is owned by the county as you mentioned. And if you go inside of it and you'll see pictures of this on my site because they gave me a tour of it about a year and a half ago, they have stabilized that structure. So if you go down into the basements, um, you will actually see um, kind of new beams running across the, the floor joists. Um, there's, there's been some work in the attic with some of the air ducts and stuff. So 
So that's a good example of a place where, you know, I, there's not kind of a final solution to what's going to happen with it, but it's not going to fall down anytime soon because as, as kind of rough as it looks from the outside, it also just looks amazing. Um, but it, but it is rough looking on the inside, there has been work done. So it has a very strong skeleton to it, which is, which is great. I think, I think what the county now is trying to do is figure out if they can find tenants to, to live there. Um, the county does have some programs where they will offer these very long-term leases to individuals. I think it's like a hundred years. Um, and there's some requirement on the homeowner to restore it based on, um, you know, historic principles to the home. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that works, but my impression is that that program, it's, it's been hard for the county to find the right people looking for that type of kind of dynamic or situation. So I think that's kind of where it sits today. Um, and it still has, there's a ton of work. It's not livable on the inside. I mean, it's, it's supported, it's stabilized, but you could not live in there right now. Any further questions, either in the chat or feel free to unmute and ask them yourself. I personally found that story about the desperado and the little <laughs> structure by the firehouse so interesting. I have driven past it almost every day since I went to elementary school at Monocacy and have always been so curious. So that was so interesting to hear a little story about it. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I mean, I've always been generally curious. And then if I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I, it, it just reached a point of annoyance because I was getting so many emails about it to where I was finally like, okay, fine. And then it ends up that, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting background to it. Um, so, so yeah, so hopefully we can uh, get some work done there and, and that place will, will be around with its little nativity scene out front for, for generations to come. Yeah, I had always noticed it with the nativity scene and wondered if it was just built to look nice behind the nativity and be storage other times in the year. So that was so interesting to hear how much more history was behind it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, and then the future of the Darby House, um, I, I assume you're talking about, there's, there's a couple of Darby houses actually, but the Darby house I think you're referring to is the one next to the Darby store right there in Bellsville. I, I am not completely sure what the future looks like. Um, that's another example of a property owned by a county, by the county, looking for that kind of um, homeowner arrangement. I know they've been doing a lot of work in there. Even recently, I've seen, I've seen workers there doing stuff on the interior. Um, that's another place if you're interested in seeing the inside of it. It's on, I went in there and it's on my site. Um, it's a, it's a, that's a beautiful house. Um, it's a bit new for my taste in that it was built like in 1905, but, um, but it's a really, really cool house. Any more questions? Well, if we don't have any further questions, of course, you can always email us info at PoolsvilleSeniors.org and we can pass your questions along. You can also check out Kenny's website and I'm sure contact him through there, which he put in the chat. Yep. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation and learned something new. Um, if you'd like to unmute and turn on your camera to say goodbye, now is the time. I'd like to thank Kenny for this presentation, as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you so much. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. Like I mentioned earlier, this time next week, we will be back with a conversation with the Honorable Connie Morella, who I'm sure some of you know. Um, you can check out our website at poolsvilleseniors.org to register and find more info. Thank you all for attending. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Ken. Thank you.